Hello, hello. Hello, guys. Hello, hello. Just sending invitations for people here. Okay, hello, hello. Okay. Falcone. Falcone. Already invite him. So, hello, Daniel. Hey, my man. Hey. Let me fix this thing real quick. I'm sorry. All right. You have, we have time. No worries, bro. Okay. We get this thing kind of. I, I never do this this way, so forgive me. I'm, I'm figuring it all no, out. No, that's all right. I'm just going to try to wedge this forward so we can. There. How's that? All right. Good. Perfect. Hello. So, Daniel, um, just, let me just tell these people who don't know you. Uh, it's really hard to, to get you and to talk with you. You are a busy man and you, you play with some of the best people in the world. And thank you so much for being here. And it's the first time Daniel is using the Instagram. So he did everyone. So I had to ask him to connect all this. So sorry if something goes wrong. Daniel, please, yes. can you tell us something about you, about your beginning, where you are from, who put you on the music world, how you did start, where? Sure. Yeah, so I, I was born in, uh, in upstate New York. My father was a, was a jazz pianist and moved to Las Vegas, wanted to give it a shot, and ended up being uh, Frank Sinatra's pianist and conductor and musical director. By moving here, they, he discovered him, and, and so uh, I grew up here as a kid, checking all of that stuff out, and <laughs> going to all those rehearsals. And in fact, uh, his first trumpet player, Charlie Turner, gave me my first trumpet, and wow. uh, yeah, that's kind of how I started, just being around it, listening to it, and then had the, you know, the uh, great fortune of my father, you know, being able to get me started in the business and putting me in the trumpet sections down on the fifth trumpet, you know, and uh, learning, learning by, uh, in, by fire, you know, <laughs> trial by fire. And well, so, yes. That's I incredible. I, I had no idea about your yeah. father. That's who. Yeah. And there was a great, great musicians union here in Las Vegas, still is, but back then we had a, a rehearsal hall. And as a kid, I would go there with my trumpet after school, you know, at, at Friday nights or whatever, and hope that somebody didn't show up. They'd have the kicks bands where guys from all the different shows would come together and play. And, uh, and every once right. in a while, they wouldn't show up and they'd say, hey, bring the kid up, you know, and I'd go up there and s struggle. <laughs> so you, you mean like a jam, like a jam every Friday? All the famous guys. Yep, they would bring oh, man, that's awesome. big band music, and um, and they would play all through the night, all the way till the sunrise. You know, Monday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and so I would just uh -huh. go instead of partying in high school like normal people. I was a band geek, you know, and went and did that, and that's kind of where I learned how to play. That was really oh, man, that's unbelievable. Yeah. Well, I can see I can see that on your back um, a few a few nice nice covers and posters and i will ask you later uh, because these people knows um, who you play with but w which was the first big job you got as a trumpet player well i mean in high school i worked there were shows right we have we have all casinos here and they had a showroom so starting at about 15 i started playing with shows that were here like uh, jerry lewis or um uh, Tony Bennett, you know, people like that, I would do their shows. So that's really where I started. But the first big tour I did was uh, Tom Jones. I, oh, uh, wow. Yeah, that was the first big touring thing that I did. Awesome. I opened one of his shows here in England. Was I was right? lucky to, yeah, I was lucky to, in Taunton, yes. Great voice. So you have been living in Europe for a while, or, or how, no. how did you? No, 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 I never lived in Europe. I toured in Europe a lot with uh, different artists, Tom and Selena. Okay. But, well, you know, that's why I'm asking. Lived, I lived in Las Vegas my whole life, other than when I went to college, and I went to the University of Southern California, USC. And uh, All right. 
down there for a couple of years and studied with the guys that were my heroes and, uh, and then came back to Las Vegas. So, yeah, I finished out. Yes. So, so Celine Dion, uh, of course, is a big, big name and everyone knows. But let's talk about someone that is now the big name, which is Lady Gaga. How, to be to be with to be good is really hard to be at your level is is a uh, one guy in a million but then to get the job to play with one of that singers it, it you really need to be good but to be consistent as well because being good is not enough to be touring with that guys and and we know that but some of the kids that are watching this or will watch they don't uh, what what are the um, the requisites the requirements to to be there, to be in a tour with someone like Lady Gaga? Well, you know, the, I mean, I think there's a few things. Obviously, you have to be able to play, and you have to be able to play consistently, like you said. And so that's really important. I think being a, uh, a decent person in a tour, because when you're touring, you know, you're in tight quarters with people all the time. So you got to know how to get along with people. You don't want to you know, be one of those guys that rubs everybody the wrong way. I think that's important too. You know, you really need to have people skills, yes. you know, but yes. yeah, consistency is the number one thing because, you know, when you're touring, like when we were out with Celine, we'd go to Europe, you know, we have jet lag um, or, you know, maybe we'd get beat up for one show and then have to play the next. And so it's really important that even when you're not feeling good, which for me is pretty much all the time, <laughs> it never really <laughs> feels great. There's always something, you know, learning how to be so prepared that you can overcome any physical problem, you know, mentally, you, you have to be able to think past the problem and get, get around it, you know? And so that comes from, for me, that just came from experience, just playing all these years. I played before uh, when the showrooms, okay, so I'll try to give you a quick explanation. In the 19, late 1980s uh, in Las Vegas, the musicians went on strike because the hotels were going to tape music. They weren't using live musicians. They wanted to save money, right? So yes. during that period, the only place to play uh, into the 90s was in what are called lounges in Las Vegas. And those were free rooms where people would go and have some drinks and have entertainment for free, right? And so during the period where musicians were on strike, the lounges actually had some pretty intense bands. I mean, these guys were... They, high quality stuff because nobody was working anywhere else. So I was fortunate to, to get into a, a band that was, um, they played a lot of like we did Earth, Wind and Fire and uh, uh, Tower of Power, those kind of things. And it required, so it was five and a half hours or six hours a night. And usually from, you know, a lot of times it would be midnight to five or things like that. And, and so by playing six nights a week that much of really hard stuff, you get hurt. You, you know, you have to figure out how to get around swelling and, you know, tiredness and pulling a muscle, whatever. And so yes. for me, that's really where I kind of, that was kind of the trenches, you know, where I learned, okay, so if I got to produce Tower of Power music or play an Earth, Wind & Fire tune and, and I can't even buzz a note, right? How am I do that, right? So you learn all the things that you have to do. So I think that's really important with consistency is just getting yourself in a situation where you're playing all the time and having to fend off these injuries and, and things like that, you know, that, that come, even, even if you're yes. a great, just the sheer number of hours of metal on your face is going to cause some problem at some point, you know. Of course. And uh, let me just say something. Kenny Rampton is here watching us. So uh, just say hi, Kenny. Brother. Uh, great, great guy. And oh. you are talking about about lips and me and Kenny. We are, and I don't know if you are too an endorser of Robinson Remedies. Oh, yeah. Did you hear about oh, yeah. that? For sure. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. What What do you think about it? It yeah. helps. Oh it, man. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. And I and I've told uh, Kenny, you know, Robinson. I told him when I first started. I thought, ah, eh, this is going to be. Uh, yeah, but everybody has these claims. It's going to do something. Yes. And I really went into it thinking, man. Yeah, and I'll tell you, that stuff has saved my life on many a game. Me too, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah it's really awesome. great. Even like, I'll even put it up in here. You know, I'll take and, and yeah. rub it in my cheeks and the upper, all of this muscle. Yes. Stuff. And I tell you, within a few minutes, I feel like a second wind come on. You know? True. 
So, that's yeah. good. That's good to know. Uh, and I use just regular Blistex sometimes just to rehydrate just on the chops. Oh, right. I play, my chops tend to swell a lot, which sucks, you know. And so, and normally it's because I get dried out a little bit. So that, I use that and then I put the, the Robinson's Remedy everywhere. Man, what a what a great product that is. Okay. It helps, yes. Uh, but you, you, you said now, and Alan Vizuti on our interview, he said as well that, and, and people think that great players never, never have problems. And Alan Vizuti said the same. His lips naturally, since the beginning of his career, swell a lot as well. Yeah. So he's one of that kind. Um, and you are talking about, uh, uh, of course, the psychological part of getting around that. For example, I'm 32 now, and I'm just now getting to the age that I'm learning myself how to go around. So it took me till now. Two years ago, I damaged my lip badly, for example. So how, how do you, for example, the day after, you are really swollen. Yeah. Imagine you take the trumpet. How do you warm up when you have no time to warm up on a show and we know how tours are? Well, you know, I never, I never allow myself to have no time to warm up. So I'm going to tell you that now. I'm, I'm uh, one of the guys that this didn't come naturally. I'm not a, a natural trumpet player. I have had every possible problem. My teeth are wrong. They're twisted, shifted. I have an overbite. I have to push my jaw forward when I play. Yes. In fact, I'm doing a master class for this Brazilian trumpet uh, festival. The Jazz and Trumpet Festival. Yeah, and it's about my master class is about how to do this when you're not a natural high note guy, how to how to develop it, you know. So what, for me, I make sure I always start, and it's a drag because I'm a slave to it, but I always start my day you know, I give myself at least three hours before I have to leave for a gig. I, I start warming up slowly. That's awesome. I don't, play, I don't play for three hours, but intermittently within that time. Sometimes it only takes me 30 minutes, 40 minutes. Sometimes it takes me an hour and a half. Depends how, how they feel. Now, as I've gotten older, I've gotten better at not damaging my chops. I haven't really hurt myself in a long, long time. But when I was younger man, there would be days I'd pull it out and nothing. So what I do is I'll start with double pedals. I use a lot of double pedals where the mouthpiece right. is not even really on the bottom. It's sitting on the top of the bottom lip. It's not, the bottom lip is not doing anything. You know, and I let that top yes. flutter in there. Um, let me see, I haven't played a note today. but almost like, the, almost like the Maggio kind of sound. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, I don't need to show you. You know what that is. So yeah, so I'll do that and, I, and I'll do that probably for, you know, depending, I'll do it until it feels good, but normally I have a, a routine of doing it and it takes 10, 15 minutes just of that. You know, first I'll start with a mouth, I'll, I'll try to just get a buzz. I'll just. Yes. So that responds really easily with an air attack, right? Once yes. that happens, then maybe I'll, I'll do the Schlossberg in the front page of the book where you're G up to C on the mouthpiece, you know, and then tongue the C. And then once that feels really good, then I'll go to the double pedals. And by the time I'm done with the double pedals, usually all that swelling or tension in the chop has released. Then I yeah. start my at that point. Okay, that's, re that's really, really good. And it, it goes, goes on the same way uh, that most It, the funny thing is most of the greatest players in the world have been in this channel and yeah. all all the guys independently of the style they play the the fundamentals are always more or less the same way um exactly as you are saying and, and that's that's incredible especially when we talk about tour and i think uh, the young generation is listening a lot of commercial music much yeah. more than classical, especially now. I think in Europe is starting now. And we need to understand because kids hear you playing. They hear Celine Dion, they hear Lady Gaga. Oh man, that trumpet there. But they then I see kids on Facebook. How do I play a double C? And you've probably saw that. And people that knows nothing about trumpet or playing high is teaching them, teaching them how to squeeze notes. Yeah. It happened to me before, and we need to be careful. We need to listen to people like you. For example, you were saying something about the jaw. Yeah. Just last year, I had a lesson with a really famous guy. I'm not going to even say his name here, but 
he told me about that i had no idea so i had to push my jaw forward and and start using it a lot and i had a lot of pain here so yeah. do you want to tell us because you're going to have the master class i don't want you to go into that a lot because most of us will be on that master class on the jtf they are our brothers in brazil but can you tell us a bit of that jaw what it can do for people with um deficient uh embouchures yeah. or Yeah, well, for me, it was a structural issue. When I was a kid, um, I have, so my, if, if you look, this would be my top teeth. This is my bottom teeth. You know, they're not like this. They're not even like this. They're, they're like that. So the orthodontist, when I was a kid, said, hey, let's, I mean, at one point, they talked about breaking my jaw, <laughs> which that was out of it. <laughs> they wanted to do braces and all kinds of things. And I was playing trumpet, and I didn't want to screw myself up. Looking in hindsight, it might have been better to just knock it out and start over again, but I didn't. So I have lived with this, uh, this I don't know if that's called an overbite or an underbite. I think that's an overbite. Yes, like so, mine. Yeah, so I, you know, I can get my finger almost between the two. So when I play the trumpet, in order for me not to point down, you know, because if I play, let me grab a horn here. You know, if I were to have this, naturally, when I was playing, I was like this, and I was puffing you know, as a, as a kid in high school. And so in order for me to, to rectify that, when I go to play every single time when I breathe, that jaw yes. comes out, right? Now, yeah. the problem is all these muscles and, and then you start developing TMJ and all these problems, right? So it takes a long time to get the muscles strong enough to support that. I mean, there would be times when I was younger, I could do it for a while. And then they would get tired. And as soon as they got tired, things would slip back and then they'd cut your chops and the whole thing, you know. So I don't advocate it as a trick in, to play or to, to help you play higher. I don't. I only do it because it's a necessity for me in order to not have a downward angle. And, and because my teeth are shifted weird, I, it's I cut. cut very deeply right here. I have a big scar, huge scar. Exactly the same right there. Yes. And, you know, so that's the reason I do it. Um, I don't know. Maybe it does help people play in the upper. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even want to discuss that with people because I don't want to screw them up. You know, I, I think you should play. With well, yeah, yeah. You know, you put the horn up where it feels good. That's where you play. <clears throat> But I'm sure there are guys who figured all this out. I know there's like, you know, uh, upstream players and all that kind of thing. And I know that works for a lot of guys. I, I can't do it. I just don't do. It just doesn't. It's not. It doesn't interest me. You know. No. So exactly. Just, if you if, if you found if you found your way and is consistent as you say and uh, is good is it, that's it. Uh, in in, ter in terms, the, do you think? Let me ask you this, but nothing to do with the interview. But th do you think because I didn't know the, know the story of your father? Do you think that the 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 power that people gave, for example, meeting Frank Sinatra, meeting all that guys when you were young? Yeah. I, I'm sure. I, I'm sure. They, that kind of guys, they don't lie. They, they will not tell you that you play well if you play bad just because oh, you are yeah. the son of... Or, or they will not have you in the band just because you are the son of blah, blah, blah. So I'm sure you were playing well when they started integrating you and all that because you worked hard. But do you feel that helped you to develop your mental uh, thing when, when someone famous, someone good told you you are doing well, you are good? Do you think that helped you? Well, yeah, I mean... I don't know that anybody ever said that to me until I started working with Tom, Tom Jones. I can tell you that story, but you know, my father was a demanding guy. Like he was a, he had super high integrity, especially musically. Uh, he would not stand for it. So if he put me on the band and I didn't make it, I'd be gone. He would never keep me. He would have never just because I was this kid, there was no nepotism. Absolutely. He would give me the opportunity, you know, and I was thankful for that, but I had to earn it. And he used to instill that in me. Like, you know, don't think just because I put you up there, you're going to stay up there. You got to, you know, you got to earn it. And I'm talking yes. to the other guys. And if they tell me he's not cutting it, you're out, you know? And, and so I worked really hard, you know, in high school, I mean, I was practicing four or five, six hours a day, you know, I mean, I was really shedding and I was really fortunate to have those opportunities and to be at the union with great trumpet players who would take me under their wing and kind of guide me, you know, and show me, okay, They'll play a shout chorus. Now you play the shout chorus. You know, they put me next to them on the first trumpet. 
and I had no right of being there. You know, I wasn't ready for that, but they, but they pushed me and helped me. And it, and it, it really got me to a, a place where I felt somewhat confident that I could play it. I mean, I always had a lot of doubt in myself as a kid, you know, uh, and I had to overcome that too, you know? So, but yeah, being around, you know, being in those seats, you know, playing behind these big stars and everything. Yeah. That really helped. I think that would help me, you know, have a more confidence in what, but I'd say more so just being around other great trumpet players, you know, hearing yes. what they, uh, learning from them just by sitting next to them, you know, and having an attitude of, man, I don't know anything and I need to learn everything. That's the key, I think, you know. That's the most important, yes. Because I knew a lot of other kids that were, not other kids, but it'd be going into college, you know, who had these kind of opportunities and they had a lot of head problems. You know, there were big attitudes, that were, you know, compensating and they had big egos. And, and I think that kind of threw them into a downward spiral because eventually people don't want to work with somebody like that, you know. You got to be My confident but be cocky right i was going to that that's always the the end of our interviews is exactly that subject because we are having i think we are having especially with internet now is more perceptible not that is more now than it was in the past but now we can see a lot of that um too much self-confident and uh, people is not humble at all and people think they know everything just because they have books and they have videos and a lot of like and it doesn't matter it, it doesn't matter at all um, and that's why I asked you uh, the the requisites to be in a tour with someone like Lady Gaga. I was I was refer referring exactly to that, to being a good guy, a team, because we know to you need to play really well to be with any of that artist. But it's more than that, uh, and you can't be inside of a tour for months with people that is always fighting each other and no one cares. It is really bad. Uh, can I ask you how is the how is your job now in terms of touring? Uh, how we, with COVID, how are the things? How is the future now? Yeah, well, there hasn't been any work. I've been out of work playing wise since the beginning of COVID. Um, I'm hearing that Las Vegas is going to open back up in June, and uh, awesome. we'll see what happens. You know, we're waiting to hear from Lady Gaga if she's going to come back here. I, I'm pretty certain she is, and then we can, you know, in, go back to work with her. Uh, I don't know, you know, as far as tours, I hear that there are a lot of them gearing up, getting ready to go again. Um, so I don't know. I guess it all really depends. Like, I, you know, I know that Europe was having a little difficulty again with COVID. And so with that, I would doubt that they're going to be booking big 50,000 seat stadiums for a while. But again, I don't know. You know, I'm just not sure how that's all going to play out. All right. And in terms of recordings, as you are in Las Vegas, do you do many movie stuff and uh, no you... not movies i've done some netflix tv shows here uh we just did the there's a, a band called the chain smokers um and we just did their new album so i'm i'm in a i don't know if you're familiar with santa fe and the fat city horns the band that i play with okay the, well, that's, the one, sorry? it's called santa fe and the fat city horn no yeah, it, it's a pretty unbelievable group and in fact that's how that group has been our showcase and we got uh, our horn section, which is made up of six horn players. We got hired for Bette Midler. We, we did her show for a couple of years because she came to see the band live. Um, yes. Celine, Celine Dion and her, her, her husband came with the MD and that's how I got hired for that. Uh, and and a few, many of us from the section got hired for that. Uh, Lady Gaga, the entire horn section got hired with, we were all going to audition, you know, they were auditioning everybody in town and the uh, musical director came and he heard us and he just said, don't even bother, you're in, you're up, <laughs> you know, so that band is pretty spectacular and we've got a few albums out. We played every Monday night for the past 20 years, but the band has been around for 40 years, you know. Wow. Yeah, but this incarnation with this horn section started in like 04, 2004, right around then. And... Um, it's it's pretty spectacular, man. So uh, I'll have to well, send you some. Yeah. Oh yes, please, uh, and I will I will share it too. So this interview, just for people to know who is watching and who will watch, will be on YouTube and Facebook straight after. Um, with and I will send this everywhere. Uh, I will send this to Ken Robinson to hear oh, that cool. little part we talked about, of course. Um, and I need I need to order more. Uh, let me see if there's any question for you here. 
all right. If anyone wants to ask a question to Daniel, we are heading to the end of the interview. The interviews are not long because Daniel has his life. Daniel, I want to ask you something really, really special for me, listening to your story. Are you passing to your kids? Because you told me in private that you have kids uh, and that's good. Are you passing to your kids the same love that your dad passed to you, to the music? Well, or? Yeah, you know, I've tried. My, my children, and I'm somewhat thankful <laughs> because you know how difficult it is to be a musician. Um, they, my daughter, my son started on trumpet. He, had, he sounded wow. great. But he didn't want to play guitar. Uh, his... His godfather, well, my daughter's godfather is a guitar player with Sly and the Family Stone. So, you know, we were going to have him do some teaching, and but then he kind of lost interest. Now he's gung ho to be a, a firefighter. That's his goal. He wants to be a firefighter. All right. I'm all supportive of that. That's beautiful. If he comes yes. in, also great. My daughter, on the other hand, is a tremendous talent. She has a perfect pitch, she can play piano, she sings great. She's an actress. She's done a couple of television commercials already. Yeah. Um, so I'm not actively teaching her, but I kind of like she'll be playing piano and I'll sit with her and work with her on a couple of things or, you know, we'll we'll talk about pitch and, you know, how, but she nails it. Like we, I can tell her any song that she knows it. she'll bang, hit the first note and it's dead on without any <laughs> reference. She doesn't understand that she has it, but well, yes. Gonna, Develop that, so I'm going to help try to help her a little bit and see if she wants it. That's so so. They want it. I don't want to push it on them, you know. So. Yes, and that's that's the most important music we need to enjoy. My son, my son started on trumpet too, and he gave up. Whatever is his choice, but I hope we can hear about your your family name again in the future with another generation. Will be awesome. Uh, so. The last two questions, Daniel, really quick. One is, what is for you the most important uh, for anyone that is watching this from, uh, not professionals, but let's say average students, what should they work every single day? What is the, the base they need to, to be ready every day? Well, I would say, you know, working on creating a sound that they want. So. For me, I think what was really important growing up, I mean, I did all of it. You know, I did the R bands and the Charlie A and the St. Jacobs and the Schlossberg and the Clarks. All of those books, I was in it every day. So foundational things are crucial. But I was listening to hours and hours and hours of music every day. I was constantly listening and not just jazz. You know, I, I, love, I love Van Halen and I love Rush and I loved... Um, You know, I love singers. I like listening to a lot of Sarah Vaughan and, you know, other people. I'd say having a diversity of music so that you're not pigeonholed into one. You know, I see a lot of guys now. I know a lot of guys who are great jazz players. But then if I have to have them play something in a commercial style or a funk style, they get tied up a little bit. You know what I mean? Or yes. Classically, classically trained and they can't swing. You know, I think so. I think it's important to just really immerse yourself in all kinds of music that you like and and then immerse yourself in players that you like right so for me i was constantly listening to, to trumpet players and sax players and trying to get an idea of the sound that i wanted in my head you know so i think that's yeah. really crucial I, i find a lot of kids today just don't listen to enough music you know they're not listening and go way exactly. back go way back like go back to lewis armstrong go back you know uh, there's so many incredible musicians that, that, yes. we, that we've all come from, you know, and it's important exactly. to have all of that, I think. All right. That's good. And listen to the Santa Fe horns because we're going to yeah. find it. I will find the, the links and, yeah, and I will show you. Yeah. YouTube and we've got a bunch of albums and you can come to santafeband.com. Yeah. All right. Santafeband.com. Okay. Yeah. okay. So I will write it. That's the greatest band I've ever played with. I mean, it's not <laughs> close, honestly. It's just... Can't understand. imagine. Daniel, the last question, you, you already answered it and it's uh, the same for, for every artist here. And it's funny because, again, the answers always go the same. That's why you are who you are and you are heroes for all of us. Um, who, so being a good musician is not enough 
to to be a good professional and what is your message to the young generation in not about playing but about imagine people that plays really well what is your message for them if they want to be like you if they want to be successful in a career about being humble about being a good human being because i think is is a lot important to talk about this now especially yeah. at the moment yeah well i mean there's just so many great players there are, it's it's mind blowing how many times i go to a city and hear guys that are just masters and you know I never heard of them before you know what i mean there are so many people out there that are that you're and i don't want to say competing because i don't like to think of it as a competition but people who want the same job that you do or are trying to you know so i think what sets you apart from someone else is who you are as a person how you treat other people um you know not kissing butt you know that i don't mean it like that because yeah. i think that yeah. that's a detriment too i don't like i can't stand people like that and you see it all the time yeah. and they get work but you know they they're just slimy you know it's it's a matter of being being who you are projecting that to people and hopefully people will recognize the people that are like you or care like you do will recognize that so you want to be genuine and honest with people and then i think you want to be professional so show up early never show up on time right that was something my dad used to tell me all the time everybody hears it you know yes. on time right? I, i i try to be somewhere at least a half an hour before if not an hour before on a gig just to make sure if there's any problems or look anything down you know be be humble right don't even if you play well don't project a jerky attitude to people because some people are going to take that the wrong way you know i know i i play with a lot of great players who can act like jerks you know and i love their playing but i can't stand being around them you know yeah so, exactly and basic stuff that everybody really knows but i think the most important thing is if you believe in yourself that you can do the job just believe it go be prepared over prepared get yourself like we talked about like if you go to the gig and you're hurt you know i can't tell you the number of times i've gone to a gig and thought i don't know how i'm going to get this out i don't know <laughs> yeah. right honestly and and uh and yet because i've done so much preparation and gone through this so many times and then you've got to trust yeah i know it's muscle memory i know where that is i know how to get around that injury yes. i know how to right so being super over prepared being nice to people being professional being on time you know dress nice don't don't dress like a slob you know i mean basic yes. stuff it still holds true today as it did in the 50s i mean that's not a whole lot of difference there, exactly you know? the rules are but the same they really are you know and and unfortunately there's less and less for us to do that's the hard part so the more you're prepared them because you have more people buying for the same job there's just not as many I mean think about it back even when i was a kid there were i don't know how many hotels in las vegas but let's call it you know more than a dozen and each one had a full big band plus two full big bands that would relieve those bands right on their nights off So think about how many trumpet players were working, right? It was ridiculous and making good money. Now today, I mean, I remember before the before everything ended with COVID and all that, there might have been four trumpet jobs in Vegas. You know what I mean? Yes. Like, where you can make any money, you know. And maybe yes. maybe and that. So it, you have a ton of other people. Yeah, and they're all great. Everybody's working hard and want, and they sound good. I listen to guys online all the time. I'm blown away with how good trumpet players are today they're just you know yes. they've they're just killing it so you've got to set yourself apart from that in some way because there's plenty of guys who can play as well as well as you or you just have to be the best you know and it's one of the two so you you, you got to find the balance in there yes yes and and then then is waiting for the rest as you say personality and being being professional it counts a lot so Daniel man thank you so much for being oh, here you can't imagine is an honor for me and and I didn't know you like this before you are one of the few guys that I never talked to much before but it's I'm so glad and thank you so much because these these interviews stay stay forever on the social media we are lucky you know for this and people can watch it and rewatch it again and one yeah. day my kids will watch this too thank you so much man
You're welcome. And can I ask you a question? Why don't you tell me a little about yourself? Because I, I don't know much about you. So why don't you give... Yeah, so you, my, like my, <laughs> I will tell you quick. I will tell you quick. So I'm a Portuguese player. I'm playing in England at the moment. And I was an army player. So I got in the army with 17 years old. And when I was 21, I ended up... Uh, I, I lost my contract with the army. In Portugal, we get to a six years contract. It's over. And I end up living on the streets. So I lived on the streets for three years. Uh, I moved to England. And in England, I started working in a restaurant. I could buy a trumpet. And I got a job a year later with that same rubbish trumpet <laughs> in an orchestra in Bristol. So I restarted. I just uh, released my first solo album now as a jazz player, jazz funky. I will send it to you as some of the biggest names in the market too. So the trumpet player of Andrea Bocelli and Rod Stewart, uh, some guys, Ed Sheeran. So a lot of great players from Brazil as well. I will send it to you and you can have a listen. Okay. But it was, it was my journey. And now I'm cool. Thank you. Uh, nice. But with my feet on the floor. With my feet on the floor. Beautiful. Great. Thank you so much. Man. Yeah, thank you, my friend. Come visit us. Peace and we will we will talk. All right. Ciao. Ciao.